So yeah, but it's been it's been fun just setting it up, and I'm so grateful that you take this time out to you know talk with us, so we can also learn all these new things like restreaming to multiple platforms together. Wow, <laughs> my absolute pleasure. It is amazing, isn't it? Thank you. So for everyone who's uh, listening in, if you're joining in us, joining us in here for the first time, uh, Adila is actually Dr. Adila Afiz. She's the founder of uh, the Life Whispering Institute, and she has so many accomplishments under her belt, which I'm going to hope to try and, uh, you know, wiggle out of her herself. Uh, but also, that helps us um, really tap into her experiences especially around this whole thing on the imposter syndrome, which truly is about when anybody who is a genius or who is a really, really high achiever, when that person starts to doubt themselves and starts to believe, really, am I truly a genius? Am I really good enough? Do I really deserve all of this? That's when the imposter syndrome is at its either kicking in or at its peak. And by the way, the very interesting thing is it is there for women and for men. Just the trouble is that it's kicked in more for women because the men are contributing to that conversation for them in their heads. Uh, so we're going to speak about that with Adila. Adila, you've been uh, you've been a chiropractor. You've done so many different things, and you started out with body whispering. You know, 10, 11 years ago, you started streaming it, and then you started doing all these wonderful classes and bringing it to everyone. Um, Tell me what has your experience been? How have you dealt with, have you first and foremost, have you felt the imposter syndrome gone through it? And then how have you dealt with it? Yeah, so I think everyone struggles with or encounters imposter syndrome. And one of the reasons I think this is such an interesting conversation is some people might have heard the term and be familiar with the term and think they identify it with it. But then there's other people who don't call it that, and yet it is still what we are experiencing. So basically, this conversation that is everywhere around self-worth, being worthy of, who am I to, and am I qualified enough, am I good enough, basically, is the underlying conversation when we talk about imposter syndrome. And as you mentioned, I've been um, in the healing industry actually for about 15 years, because even before I graduated as a chiropractor, my very first qualification was actually as a counselor. Um, so I did counseling, I did youth work. Um, I worked for many years with a wonderful organization um, in New Zealand. Uh, and I was a, a youth counselor and a phone counselor. And then I went on, I became a chiropractor. I've been in clinical practice for over a decade. Um, I've gone on to do many modalities and trainings, as well as, of course, body whispering, business whispering, and founding the Life Whispering Institute. But this conversation that consistently comes up, actually, the more advanced you go in your healing journey, and the more work you do, or the higher up you go, as you were just mentioning. Um, and it's not that people have to identify as a genius or as a high achiever. It's like, no matter what you are here to do and whatever gifts or talents that you have, whether you are a, a great mother, a great teacher, a great dancer, whatever, that doubt that creeps in around, can I do this? Am I good enough to do this? There's other people who are more, you know, more qualified, more experienced, more well-versed than me. And so who am I to do this? Um, that is across the board. It is. And it's so, you know, it really comes and hits back home that it's not just uh, it's not just in schools and in universities and corporates. It's also happening to us inside our own homes. Yeah, for so all of those, all of our viewers who are mothers, you know, mother's guilt, that normally comes from comparison or this idea that other people are doing much better than them at mothering. And the fact is, everyone's just doing their best. Yeah. We all are trying our best. We all, all are putting in our best. And yet, 
um, I think it's just so disenabling that you do it all. You really, really put in your hard effort and your hard work. And when it comes time to reap rewards, or even when it comes time to just put that out there in the open for the world to see, we all shrink inside and say, oh my God, is this any good? The other person did it better. And I look at it and, you know, you look at it in celebrities, you look at it in your own, uh, it was very interesting, your own domestic staff. We have one young lady who cooks for us and she's brilliant. She's like this really, really good girl. And uh, each time she tries something new, she's got this, this thing in her hands. Her food is always great. Each time she tries something new, she'll come and say, it's not good, is it? I feel like, but it's great food. Don't worry about it. I think it's just so deeply ingrained. Adina, where does this, I, I'm just, just very curious. Uh, this whole thing of, I'm not good enough. You're not good enough. Um, I've always been curious what what is it about and you've you've been doing so much about you know doing stuff around uh, uh, neuros and neuro linguistic stuff and uh, even otherwise you'd mentioned it neuro something which I'm sure you will say it now <laughs> sorry about that but you've been working on all of this what pushes us into negating our own selves for most of us it's our background and what you said about women experiencing this more than men. It is interesting because not that many of us, and unfortunately for girls who seem to be more sensitive and more externally focused with their validation or where their self-worth comes from, we were not necessarily brought up being told, you're great, you're good enough, you can do anything you want, yes like you're doing a great job and don't worry about what everyone else is saying or doing it's the messaging is often the other way around and on top of that how we are wired is that we will look at that negative so even when something isn't meant to be a negative even when it's a learning environment or it's an opportunity for learning like you got 90 percent on a test which is great so you only miss 10 mark, but what will we focus on? We focus on the 10% normally. You miss the 10%. Yeah. Or if, you know, you have siblings or you have friends and there's an exam or a competition or a race, even if you came second or third, which is fantastic. Normally what we're thinking is, oh, I didn't come first. We don't celebrate in the same way about, oh, I came second or I came third. So that's a lot of pressure because not many of us grew up being the first and the best at everything that we did. And so that belief that starts to get hardwired in is, oh, well, I wasn't good enough at my math test. I didn't win the race. You know, my friend got a better present than me for her birthday my other friend has a bigger house than me oh my mother um, praised my brother instead of me this morning at breakfast and it's so on and so forth from there and then the other part of this when it comes to business because this is where this is starting to come through now or um, for me where I work the most is the people who are in the same industry as me, so healers, practitioners, uh, service-based business owners, coaches, people who are actually serving others with their work. And it's such valuable work. And it's right. such, such a contribution, right, to society and to the planet. Now, the people who tend to do those kinds of roles, <laughs> the people who tend to be in these industries, for the most part, you know, there's always a few people who won't fit into the status quo, but for the most part, they're very caring, empathic individuals who care a lot about other people. Right. But when we care a lot about other people, there is this underlying thing where we care a lot about what other people think. Right. And where that then places our validation and our self-worth is in the hands of other people. Wow. 
So I care enough and I care enough about what you think about me. And so I go back into this whole spin of, do you like me enough? Did I do enough for you? Did I care enough for you? Oh my God, you're not feeling happy. I obviously didn't do a good job. My goodness, what a spin to be in. And yeah, it is true. Um, I have seen that in a lot of healers. In fact, I think also because healing has such an intangibility to it or the energy work that we do has such an intangibility to it and there's nothing to prove. Um, well, for the most part, there isn't anything that one can prove anything with. So, so that spin is just so solid. Wow, that's, that's so amazing. Actually, uh, it's also very interesting what you said, that we're hardwired to, to look at the negative about ourselves and about other people also, of course. So uh, from what you said, it seems to me, obviously, that like most other things, our conditioning, even for I'm not worthy enough, I'm not deserving enough, I'm not good enough, comes from when we were children. So, so all the more responsibility for adults to be able to ensure the conversations that they're having around children are so powerful and so enabling that these things, you know, the hardwiring starts to become a little loose as we grow up. Yeah, and that's why it's such an important um and I think parents are really trained. I mean, I work with a lot of parents and children, and I think parents are really trying their best with this now. And I think for some people in some cultures, it comes more naturally or more easily. And of course, in some families, because you can have two families in the same city, in the same culture, in the same location, but actually what that family's background and predisposition is in terms of being positively focused or negatively focused, more enabling or less enabling when it comes to encouraging children and state of mind and encouraging kids to have a go regardless of the result, as opposed to being very result oriented, which means if they don't get a good result or a high result, then, you know, they're, they're told that, well, that you didn't do a good enough job or there was no point you doing it. Which, yeah. which then turns them into adults that don't want to try new things if they cannot guarantee that they're going to succeed at it. Yeah, I know that. And, you know, that's that also then moves on into risk taking. So a lot of times when we're working with the corporates and we're looking at leaders and seeing who needs to be promoted versus who not, um, we do look at the risk taking ability. And it's very interesting that then we, when we get into coaching the ones who are not very big risk takers, we do find out that their conversations are I'm not good enough. I don't think I'm, I can handle this. I think I will bring the company down with me if I make a mistake at this level. Um, yeah. Um, so it's it's so very interesting and uh, you know I also really like the part that you said that it depends on uh, the the way that you are so you could be in the same city two different families could have a completely different outlook and therefore completely different conversations that their children have in their heads I've also noticed and observed that uh, how how both the parents talk so if one parent is encouraging and so they're playing the good cop and the other is, you know, after the child study, you won't make it, you won't make it. Then those strokes, the, the concept of strokes from psychology, those strokes kind of don't end up getting balanced out. And if the child themselves, if their hardwiring is over, you know, it's too strong, then they will prefer to focus on the negative strokes. You won't be able to do this rather than the parent who's telling them, come on, try. It doesn't matter even if you fail. Yeah, it's because they start to try to win the approval of that parent right. you know so we will always tend to unfortunately we tend to gravitate towards the approval or validation from where we perceive we are not receiving it rather than where we are receiving it and so that then becomes their motivating factor so uh so strange and so fascinating at the same time that when you're tiny little kids your brain is still absorbing and giving out all of this stuff and then it's shaping you for the rest of your life unless or until there's like some major intervention that comes through either you work too much on yourself or you go through a life-changing experience that makes you get away from this conversation of the imposter syndrome have you had any, uh, are there like any experiences that you can share with someone who did start out very deeply with the imposter syndrome and as you worked with them, they came into their own potency and they truly well, started believing? I think I said this 
said to you at the beginning of this conversation, like this is actually, I said it to you last week when we were chatting, this is actually what we're talking about nearly all of the time. It might look like different conversations or sound like different conversations, but actually what people who are listening might find interesting is the more advanced we get into the more healing work you've done, the more you've cleaned up everything else, the more you've, you know, worked through your blocks and you're aware of your blocks and you've overcome them. What remains is the self-worth thing and what you are deserving of. And it crops up in a different way at each new level of success or self-healing or self de uh, personal development that you're stepping into. So it's, um, this is basically what I do with people all the time in all of our classes and all of our sessions. I've done a couple of sessions this week. This is exactly the conversation we've been having. I worked with a um, six-figure, a multiple six-figure business owner last week. They want to scale to that next level financially in their business. This is a person who is a healer themselves. They've done you know, really well over the years and they're very self-aware and very aware of these trends um, in terms of imposter syndrome. And yet what it still comes down to when it came to the block that, was, that they were hitting up against was, yeah, Am I worthy of being able to have it all and being allowed to make this much money when no one else in my family could have it or no one else I know has had it with ease or been told that they're allowed to have it or has been able to do it doing the work that they love? And we worked through that in you know one session because that's how powerful i mean you know how powerful body whispering is but we used a body whispering session for that um and we're going to do that in the business whispering class coming up this weekend is we're working a lot on it comes down to permission why are you allowed to do this or to have this when no one else you know has it or had it or told you that you were allowed to have it. So here we are as adults. And one of the hardest things that we have to do, probably the hardest thing I have had to work through in my career and in my life is building and creating a life and sticking to it when no one else told me I was allowed to, no one else was encouraging me to do it. And in fact, no one was telling me that it was possible. So it's very lonely when you have to go beyond what your family or your community or your culture or your colleagues are choosing in their life. Right. And it's so important. And yes, I do remember uh, in most of our classes that we do together, in the most of the sessions, the focus classes, whatever, that is one of the deepest conversations that we have, that you are worthy enough. You can have it all. Uh, I think it's just the, um, as healers, I think it's also just the guilt that we carry that are we so really supposed to be looking at money versus not money? I think from the healing perspective, if you just talk about that, this whole conversation about as a healer, you're not meant to make money, you're not meant to have money. What is it? Why does that conversation exist? And how can one get past it? Because that, to my mind, that's also such a huge imposter syndrome thing. Yeah, that's well said. It is an imposter syndrome thing. To be very honest, I don't know where it came. I mean, we know where it comes from. It comes from all of the all of the um, backgrounds in healing and this whole concept that I'm going to I'm going to call a very almost a modern westernized concept, if I'm allowed to say that, around. Um, Oh, you know, true healers, true yogis, true gurus do it for the love of the work, for no payment, and they give selflessly of themselves. And why I find that interesting is if we go to the laws of the universe, if we go to the laws of God, consciousness, whatever you choose to call it, you know, I do not believe that we, anyone, is meant to suffer. And that 
God has given us gifts, talents, the ability to be of service absolutely to people. And that, though, is not mutually exclusive to us being able to provide for ourselves, to having enough food on our tables, to be able to provide service to others whilst not being completely stressed about our ability to keep a roof over our heads or to provide for our own children. And so this, this is quite a conflicting uh, point of view, right? And something that I teach when I'm teaching about business is it doesn't have to be one way. So I'm not saying everyone has to be a high ticket coach or, you know, charging deep up Chopra prices, whatever he probably charges now for personal sessions, right? If he's still doing them, we can charge whatever we are comfortable and congruent with because there are so many business models. You can, you can charge a very small amount and you can be of service to millions of people. You can charge a moderate amount and be of service to an average number of people. You can charge a very high amount and be of service to a small percentage of people. What I love about each and every version is that they all have their place. They all are you being of service. And there's no one right way to do it. I don't think this version is more noble than this version. And in my own journey, I've progressed. I've progressed from right down here. In fact, I've progressed from a lot of free and mostly free to low cost to mid cost. And I'm still very averagely priced and very, I'm going to use the word affordable in the services and products I offer. But one of the things that has motivated me and will motivate true leaders actually start to put their prices up and start to come more towards this end of the scale is the awareness that we tap into around when we actually find people who are willing and able to pay this, this price point. So they're investing the most. These people that invest the most go on to have the biggest impact in the world on their surrounding communities. Because when I work with a CEO, a millionaire, a global thought leader who has the financial ability to pay, the work that we do and the change that it creates for them is flowed on into their businesses, their corporations, their communities, their families, and their environments. And so the ripple effect of that high ticket is actually really great. And so it's also not fair to say, oh, only a handful of people can afford this. So why would you not make it affordable to everyone? Well, actually, if you look at the hierarchy of needs, the more our needs are met, the more we start looking at how we can be of service to more people. That's absolutely correct. And, you know, even as you were saying it, I was looking at all the people that I've done uh, body whispering sessions on who have been willing to pay a, a good amount. And you're right, the impact that they have first in their own lives as well as in the lives of the others is always, always greater because they're willing to then go out on a limb. I think it may start with this thing saying, oh my God, I've put in this much money, I might as well use it, apply whatever I've learned or whatever I've taken away from the sessions. And then they go ahead and they make that difference out there, further out there into the world. And I was also thinking of, um, you know, all these people who have like, you know, who go out and start doing things afterwards, which are off service to other people. These are people who have really left a mark uh, really, you know, if I was just to look at the corporate ladder, they've really climbed up the corporate ladder and then they come to a point where they say, now it's time for me to start giving. So they do need to reach that self-actualization stage to a certain extent and they start giving out. So, so that part of it is so true. And uh, I think, you know, one thing that strikes me always about the whole thing about healing and imposter syndrome is, uh, you know, when I'm thinking of it defiantly, is also you go into any temple, any, ch any, any church, any house of religion, and you will find that the priests are taking money. 
so if those men and women of god can take money here we are doing some work <laughs> which is actually helping individual physical bodies and the community as a whole so people out there healers out there if you have been facing this dilemma of should i charge should i not make your choice very very clearly and carefully there's nothing wrong with making money as long as that money doesn't disable you and pull you away from your path of being in service to other people is that okay 100% and i was saying to um i was having a conversation about business was from just the other day and i said this this is a universal conversation. So this exact conversation question was posed to me. And I said, look, money ultimately is a magnifier, right? So the more money we have, the more it magnifies who we truly are and therefore our choices and what we would like to do. Now, most of us, as I said, as healers, practitioners, intuitives, empaths, we care a lot about people. We care a lot about the world. We care about nature, animals, the planet, whatever you want. We are the people that go out and try to contribute, to volunteer, to, um, you know, start off uh, charities or healing initiatives or start um, animal sanctuaries. Now, wouldn't it be so much more of a blessing if these were the people that had more money in the world absolutely absolutely and totally you know there's uh, it's very interesting there's that saying which says it's very easy to be a philosopher on a full stomach yeah you know we need more philosophers right now on the planet we need more people with with full stomachs who can look like really step back and look at what's going to create peace on the planet that's one part of it the other part of it is just on a lighter note there's a movie with uh, Marilyn Monroe and she's telling the gentleman there uh, a rich man is much like a pretty woman you may not marry a pretty woman, but by God, wouldn't that help? <laughs> so wouldn't it help for you to be rich? Of course it would help. You can go ahead and you can do so much work. I do believe that as a healer, it's important for you to, and you know, this, of course, right now, this conversation is just about healers, but it's also true for anybody else. If you know that your own house is in order, you are so much more able and so much more willing to go and help other people. If you only have one sandwich and out of the kindness of your heart, you share half that sandwich or one third of that sandwich with two other people who are hungry. Sure, all three of you would have eaten, but wouldn't it help if you had three sandwiches and you could share one whole sandwich with the other two? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and that's part of this money conversation. And I think what imposter syndrome does, how that works in with the conversation we're having is people make it about themselves, about am, how can I charge this much? Like, I don't feel like I am worthy of charging this much. Now, that's not what they say, okay? There's all this other stuff on the surface that makes it seem like it's very complicated and hard for them to raise their prices and they don't know what to want. Ultimately, what it comes down to is they're struggling to put that price on their service because as service-based providers, our service is ourselves. So in other words, they're struggling to put that price on themselves, on their face, on their picture, put it out into the world and say, this is how much I'm charging. And because their messaging or their belief is, this is how much I am worth. Well, yeah. no, that's, that's incorrect. That's incorrect on multiple levels. It's not how much you are worth. And in fact, it's not even how much your service is worth. Because if you have a healing session with me and I change your lifelong debilitating imposter syndrome, how much is that worth across every area of your life when you're then able to go and get um, a promotion at work? You're, you have the confidence to go and ask the girl of your dreams to marry you. And you have the ability to stand up for what you believe in and be heard in the world. How much is that worth to you? So whether I'm then charging a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, can you really say that that session was not worth that price? 
Absolutely. I think that's so well put. It's like, are you just putting a charge on you and your ability, like you and your, you know, your face, your capability, your time and so on and so forth? Or are you actually looking at what's the impact that you're creating in another person's life and how far reaching is that impact truly? I think that's so important. And, you know, the, uh, the whole position of congruence then comes up. So whether you're a healer or you're in the corporate world, you're, you're the CEO of an organization, one of the things that I find uh, leading and actually fueling the, the imposter syndrome is our inability to get the congruence of who I be, what my energy be, and what's the impact that I'm leaving on the world. Please talk a little bit about that. There is an extent to which until you do it, you're not going to know. So it's like the, the chicken and the egg, unfortunately, which comes first. So it's like until I get more validation or more proof of the impact I'm having, it's hard for me to trust in the impact I'm having and therefore offer the services that I offer. But in Body Whispering, we continuously you will hear me talk about this concept called trust the work and trust the work is important because is when we have a process we have to trust in the process and the benefit of that is it takes us out of the equation I'm not saying trust yourself make yourself responsible for delivering the result. I'm saying trust in this process that has been shown to work and that there is evidence to support. And if you follow that process, it is going to create a result. Once you create enough results, you're going to start getting that feedback. Once you start getting that feedback, you're going to start to really believe wow, this stuff does work, this stuff does happen, this, you know, I am capable of achieving these results. And the first time it happens, you might think, oh, that was a fluke, I still don't believe it. The second time it happens, you might think, oh, that was another fluke, I still don't believe it. But, you know, five times, 10 times into it, you, you start to we call it the body of evidence, that body of evidence starts to build until you start to have to look at it and start to acknowledge that, yeah, this is actually creating results. This is actually doing something. And I can no longer negate that fact. So now I need to get behind what it is that I do. Now I need to have more conviction, or now it's easier for you to have more conviction, speaking about what you offer, speaking about the results it creates, speaking about the value that you know that it has and therefore you're then able to get to that next level of congruence and for those of you that are starting out and you're saying well how do I get the congruence well it's practice 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 you've got to do it until those results start speaking for themselves and for those of you that are well experienced and you have the results and you have the evidence and you're still struggling, then this imposter syndrome is a really great thing to, for you to look at because now you know that the issue isn't that you don't have the evidence. The issue isn't that you don't know whether this works or not or whether you should charge for it or not. The issue is your ability to be congruent with actually claiming and owning what you do and being able to voice it in the world and being willing to be visible, being willing to be seen and being willing to basically have your voice heard. And so this is where that healing work is important. And this is where I work with, um, you know, corporates or I work with high level clients who are already turning over that six figure, multiple six figure, because it doesn't go away. Something that people think is the answer is more money. And when you don't have money, it's easy to think that that is the answer. You think, oh, once I'm making $10,000, this is not going to be my issue. You get to $10,000 and you think, oh, my God, I can never imagine making $20,000. Once I make $20,000, this will no longer be my issue. Once you're making six figures, you think, oh, my God, how could I ever get to seven figures? Like, that seems so far away. I know seven-figure entrepreneurs who are having the same conversations about hitting eight figures, okay? So the conversation doesn't change. It's just a different level. 
And at each level, what I'm working with people to do is identify that self-worth belief and issue and get clear on it, clear it from their system, clear it from their mind, clear it from their body, clear it from their memory. Not because the memory is going to go away, but because we can change how we respond to the same stressor in our lives and overcome that limitation to then be able to reach that next level. Thank you. That's, you know, there's so much of gold in what you just spoke of, uh, Adila, I think. And that's one of the things that we do in our classes, which is to help, you know, just work with each other to help get rid of these disenabling beliefs that you're speaking about, change the conversation, really. It's very interesting. Um, there's a concept or a technique by this gentleman called Dr. Albert Ellis, where he it's called the RBT or the Rational Emotive Behavioral Technique or Therapy. And in that, he says that, you know, there's it's an exercise called ABCDE, where an A is the activating incident, something that happened in your past, in your childhood. C is the consequence. So how are you behaving right now about it? But there's a B in between, which is the belief that you carry about yourself related to that. And then there is something called D, which is about, can you debate, discard that disenabling belief looking at that body of evidence that you just spoke of adila so whether we're a healer or whether we're a corporate honcho or whether we're whether we're an entrepreneur working you know eight eight figure business uh, numbers or ten num ten figure numbers i think it's so important to be able to look at that disenabling conversation and then continue to debate it discard it and then create a new belief about yourself change the conversation entirely if you want to change the result it's that thing right if you want a different result, you have to start doing things differently. You can't have the same conversation in your head and expect the results to be something else. It's so important for us to kind of look at that. And I think that's one of the things that we will be, uh, and I, I just want to introduce the fact that we'll be doing a class, a focus class on the imposter syndrome and how do you address it with body whispering in May, first weekend of May. And uh, we'll be sharing more details around that. But I think that that's definitely one of the things that we speak about. and. Um, as a facilitator of body whispering from Adila's Life Whispering Institute, I can tell you that the amount of shifts that happen, the magnitude of shifts that happen when you do these programs, when you sit down and in a focused way, you say, you know what, now is the time I have to shift this. And then the energy start working for you because you've put in that intent to say, no more of this imposter syndrome for me, I'm done with it. And it's so, so brilliant. So Adila, also when you when you speak about, and this is also my invitation for anyone who's not done it to please see if you'd like to attend Adila's Business Whispering session class that's happening over this weekend. Adila, tell us a little bit more about, uh, you know, what are aspects of um, imposter syndrome can be addressed through classes of body whispering, of business whispering, et cetera, please. Yeah, absolutely. And just based on, you know, the whole concept you were talking about earlier about the incident that occurs, the consequences that were created and the beliefs that you then created around it. And while it is about changing the conversation, what you're going to find is the limitation when you're trying to change that conversation purely from a cognitive place. Right. And so what I love about body whispering, business whispering, any of the work that I do is it is not just cognitive because that's a very, very slow, still helpful, but very, very slow way of changing things or creating change. We have to, for fast results, what we do in classes, what I do in sessions is we're hitting it at all three levels of that mind, body and energy. And we do that by activating that energy, bringing forth the memory or the incident that originally occurred. Everywhere where then your body physiologically stored a memory, your mind created a story about it, and it created a limitation energetically as to what was possible for you. And we go and we clear it at all three levels. And that's why body whispering and business whispering are so effective, because actually we take your mind out of the equation because we have found that if we focus on your body, focus on your energy and focus on the physiological response that is there to keep you safe, if we undo that safety mechanism and make this topic a safe space for you, 
you can then go further or beyond anywhere that you were previously getting stuck or we talk about hitting that glass ceiling. So we do, as you said, have a business whispering class coming up this weekend. And business whispering is the particular branch of the work that I do that focuses on business and money and creating it and dealing with it intuitively, authentically, and, and incorporating all levels of mind, body, and energy as you create your business, as you create money as you create income streams, as you put products and services out into the world, what's the most congruent and authentic way for you to create your business that's also going to make you successful? Body Whispering, we have a very similar concept, but it's focused on your body healing, changing your life. Um, and the reason they're two different classes is because there's just so much information we physically cannot fit it into one class and put all of that information into one class. So I do body whispering classes regularly. I, I'm doing a couple of business whispering classes this year. And the next one is this weekend. And in every class, you're learning an energetic process or exercise so that you don't have to think, oh my gosh, do I have the mental capacity to break through this? over this class. This is not about you working harder cognitively. This is about you getting to that different state of embodiment with your business, with your money, with that experience, creating a different story and start seeing the results in your life. Absolutely. That's so brilliantly put as to what's the difference difference in the two classes and as someone who's done both body and business whispering I know for a fact that there is a difference and when we're talking about business whispering and then I'm also putting this in the context of the imposter syndrome it is as good for if you're an employee um, you could actually talk to your own own tasks you could talk to your own um, work list you could talk to your own team's work that's going to happen and then create greater there you could be an entrepreneur who's running that business, you could be someone who wants to get rid of your job, a nine to five, the shackle of it and jump into becoming an entrepreneur. And you could simply be a freelancer who doesn't want to have a whole full fledged team that still wants to make money out of their business. And the business whispering class is actually good for any and all of us who are looking at creating something greater related to our work. Body whispering, of course, is about creating greater for your whole life, any which way, uh, while working on your and with your body. That's what that is all about. And if, you, if you're if you interested in working both on your business as, you know, again, whether as an employer or as an entrepreneur, as well as working on breaking through this imposter syndrome of, I won't be able to do it. Especially if you're someone who's realized in the past two years, perhaps working a nine to five is not where your heart and your success lie in, then definitely the business whispering class is for you because it starts out with breaking all these imposter syndrome conversations and it takes you to a whole level greater. And if you're looking at specifically working on the imposter syndrome, like I said, we'll be doing a class in the beginning of May, which we will be sharing information about. Adila, just before, uh, you know, I, I know we're running out of time. I know you've got a lot of other stuff to do as well. But what I really invite you to do is share some tips that people can, you know, who are listening in or who will be listening in can take away that they can start already doing, which will reduce this volume of the imposter syndrome in them. Yeah, well, I want to kind of hone in on the healers, practitioners, intuitives, empaths, because I just think the work that they do in the world, the work that we do in the world is so valuable, right? And so my number one tip for you is if you want to start making this switch is two things. Number one, make that switch, as I said, from looking at, okay, what am I doing and what am I asking for in return? Instead of making it so transactional and instead of making it about a price and a value and then trying to do the math to figure out whether you're worth that value or not, if I can invite you to look at the contribution that you are making to that person's whole life, their being, 
And the follow on effects of that session, that class, that healing that you offer. And then start to work with this business whispering or body whispering energy where we invite you to interact energetically with what intuitively feels like that fit. Okay, so start to look at what's a congruent fit for you to be charging or to be offering or to be asking for in return, not for the amount of time that you're offering or the number of sessions that you're offering, but for the change that you are facilitating for your clients. And that should help you to begin to get over this money issue, this, oh my gosh, can I really put that price on my classes or my sessions? Oh my God, will people really think I'm worth that? It's not about what you are worth. It's about they are investing in your services after you have invested how many years, hours, time, energy, money of your own to learn the services that you're offering, to learn the healing techniques, going through your own uh, learnings, bringing your own experience to that time that you're sharing together. So start to change that conversation. Yeah. And then my second tip, underlying everything that we do, we always bring body whispering into it, right? Body whispering means we have an ability to be aware of the whispers of consciousness, what is, what is the most kind of intuitive way of being or doing something. And our body is the key in body whispering. It's not because it's just about your body. It's because your body is the medium through which you receive this information. So when body whispering is being used, we ask you to pay attention to what your body is saying. So when you feel like something is a congruent choice for you, your body's going to reflect that when it is truly congruent. You're going to feel lighter you're going to feel expanded you're going to feel like you're you know relaxed you're safe your chest is open your digestive system's working you're not panicking you're not in fight or flight mode conversely when something is not a congruent fit for you if you're about to do something and your stomach is in you know a tight fist clenched if your throat is you know clenched if you can't breathe well if you're feeling nauseous if it feels very heavy that's a clue like look at what your body or your being is trying to tell you through the awareness of your body or look at what you need to address in order to make this a, a more congruent or safer choice for you in this moment so beautifully said in such uh, possibilities that get created just by doing these two things to start off with and just imagine the world of possibilities that is available when you actually start working with the energies to work through this whole piece on the imposter syndrome. I do want to wrap up, first of all, of course, by thanking you, Adila. It was a brilliant, brilliant conversation. My own world expanded so much just through that. And I'm sure everyone who's listening in now or later at any given point of time in the future, your worlds are going to expand as well. I do want to share this little bit with you. So um, I ran a body whispering session on my brother this morning and uh, it really felt like there was some wall that I broke through because you know when it's your own family you always just kind of go into a little bit of a doubt will I be able to do it will they receive will I be able to contribute to their life imposter syndrome at its best again and I tell you when I started doing the body whispering session on my brother all of that just fell by the wayside and I just flowed with the energies I have goosebumps all over again it was just so beautiful his receiving and the energy is gifting it was brilliant and that that entire conversation of body of of imposter syndrome kind of just melted away so thank you thank you thank you so much for bringing all of this into existence for sharing your thoughts your experience your wisdom with us on body on imposter syndrome through body whispering i do look forward to seeing you again adila on another live so that there can be so much more contribution to the people who listen in and to their lives Thank you so very much folks who are listening in we will be sharing the information about both the business whispering please look at my facebook and my linkedin as well about the business
for in class this weekend um you're more than welcome to sign up and really really learn from adila there's magic over there i can promise you that and we'll also share the information about the focus class on the imposter syndrome on the 7th of may till then take good care of yourself have a super day or a super evening ahead bye bye thank you so much adila okay everyone bye thank you so much.